Hello, everyone. My name is Holly Grass. I'm the technical director of Sakama, a cybersecurity consultancy based in Manchester. Um, as a pen tester, I break into computers and buildings for a living, and I'm going to rant incoherently about that towards you. I apologize in advance about my accent. I'm horrendously northern. I'll try and be as clear as I can, though. When you get invited to speak at an event like the future of cybersecurity, you want to bring out something new. You want to talk about the next threats. And most of what I do professionally speaking on a stage is talking about how security hasn't changed in decades and really we're using vulnerabilities that, to be honest, are older than half of my staff. I'll talk about things like SQL injection, which came out on Christmas Day of 1998. But I thought, no, this time for a change, I will talk about the future of cybersecurity. <laughs> and uh, the new things, the things that are worth looking at. I did the only sensible thing any technologist would do in looking at predictions for the future, or any problem, really. I Googled it. <laughs> so I looked at the problems and the predictions that people made last year. I Googled cybersecurity predictions of 2019, specifically looking at what were people on stages like this talking about last year as being the next big thing. I found a few examples. I won't call out any specific articles, but there's a lot of top fives, top tens. A few things worth looking at were things like cloud outages, nation state sponsored attacks, supply chain risk, ransomware. These things that no doubt all of the other speakers are going to be talking about throughout the day and everybody is concerned about. And I thought, this is last year and none of these things are new. It's really hard to talk about new things in cybersecurity. When did we have a major cloud outage. You remember that time that OWS went down, AWS? And it went down so bad that they couldn't update their own status page to tell us that it had gone down? That was 2017. Nation state attacks. One of my favorite examples of nation state sponsored attacks is that time that the GRU hacked into the Illinois State Board of Elections using an SQL injection attack, of course, the attack that all of the cool attackers used. A nation state sponsored attack, one nation versus another nation, a major uh, breach called out in the Mueller report. Everyone's read the Mueller report, right? Shakes, very few nods. Yeah, I don't blame you. The point there, though, 2016, uh, not the latest stuff. Supply chain attacks, Target got hit. Target got hit through their HVAC vendor. That's a supply chain attack and an awesome example from 2013. And ransomware, well, Ransomware. First example of ransomware, the AIDS Trojan of 1989. <laughs> These things aren't new. None of them are new. I'm going to try and talk about some cool things, some developments, but ransomware specifically has been around forever. If you Google the problem, you get lots of headlines. These are just some examples that are found specifically from the BBC as examples of headlines. Um, some of my favorite that you'll see, though, are things like um, US police paying the ransom. I think that's uh, an efficient process, direct from the police budget to the criminal budget. That's efficient, if nothing else. But we have huge examples of all kinds of organizations getting hit by ransomware. So, so ransomware is not new. Nation state attacks are, are, are not new. What is it that we can talk about in, in something like this? Well, ransomware is potentially changing. There's, there's new uh, aspects to ransomware that no doubt anyone who's worked in security has been talking about for years. I remember bringing up the issue back in 2017 when I was dealing with NotPetya, that lovely, lovely example of malware, which was when organizations get hit by ransomware and they make announcements like, there was no evidence that data was stolen. Uh, there was no evidence because it's encrypted. Is that why? I saw a brilliant tweet this morning, in fact. I don't remember who it was, but it was a good example of this kind of problem. Somebody's saying, when you're doing tabletop exercises with companies, that's sitting down with the board or the IT team to work through a breach, you know, what, how likely is it for some companies that you'll say, a breach has occurred, and they'll say, we'll go and get our disaster recovery plan, and they find out that it's on a network share and it too has been encrypted. We, we have these issues, but ransomware's not new. The idea of attackers stealing data is not new, but we are now starting to see it where uh, attackers who are compromising organizations are claiming to have stolen data. If you've not seen this before, you've not really considered this uh, as a risk before, is adding additional leverage to the organization. So not only are you dealing with a ransomware attack, but you might also be dealing with a future data breach, a very public data breach, because the media are already all over you. And then there's things like GDPR fines and those kinds of things. So attackers could take data before they encrypt it. 
one of the things that frustrates me greatly when we look at uh, attacks, certainly attacks like ransomware, you read newspaper, I read the newspapers too often, this is my main problem, but you read newspaper articles about ransomware, and you'll see things like Travelex got compromised, right? Hopefully everybody has noticed Travelex got compromised. It has been a while. But some of the articles writing saying the attack started on December 31st, what they're referring to is that is the point in which the attackers deployed ransomware. The network was ransomed on December 31st. That does not mean the attack started on December 31st. Whilst we don't know, it hasn't been confirmed, we have seen through previous attacks that attackers can break in, dwell on the network, wait until the most inopportune time to strike, and then ransom the network. December 31st is an awful time to take a network down. I was looking at an example of a, a council, Copeland Council got hit on a, a bank holiday in 2017. Attackers can choose these inopportune moments. And now we might see developments like I said, attackers doing things like taking data before they ransom your network. So what else is new? Talk about phishing a lot. I know that phishing was just a, something that, that Mike discussed there. Phishing is a fantastic attack. In fact, anything social engineering is fantastic. Um, in my experience, mainly because it, it doesn't necessarily work in the same way that companies think it's going to. I'm going to talk in a second about um, companies asking us to do things like tailgating. Can you break into our buildings? Can you follow our staff in and see where you can go? I mean, I can, but that's not how I would do it. My favorite example, of course, being um, if I want to get inside your building, I'll apply for a job. <laughs> and then when you turn up for the interview, you're inside the building. There's those kinds of risks, but we'll talk about some others. But just before I, I move on from phishing, Phishing, it's more than just malicious emails. I think last time I was here, I spoke about an organization I worked with that got a malicious fax. That was a good one. It's the first time I've ever professionally dealt with a fax. I have to admit that to you. But it's the same kind of attack, right? It was one of those, uh, establish a scenario in the message and then click here for more information. It sends you off to a malicious link. In this particular example, though, phishing is more than just emails. Things for the future, trying to somehow come up with a prediction of how things are going to get worse. Well, one of the things that we've seen is when companies think of phishing, they think of things like, uh, oh, can you send a malicious email attachment to my staff as if nobody's going to notice invoice.pdf.exe. I think staff are hopefully aware of that risk now. But maybe things that uh, we haven't considered are things like you know, deep fakes. It's something that a lot of companies have been talking about recently. This is generally, if you haven't come across it before, the idea to take a selection of audio, or sometimes video, but video is currently harder, selection of audio, mix it up, and then make uh, statements with that person's voice. Again, this is not a new thing. I've left the date on here. August 30, 2019, an organization got hit by one of these examples. Attackers called up the company, to do the traditional attack that we've seen, I need you to make a bank transfer. That's not a new attack to organizations. What was new in this particular example is they're using the voices of staff members. So they're using deep fakes in that way. This is a thing that I don't think many organizations have considered. In my experience, one of the things that comes out of things like security awareness training, I have a lot of problems with security awareness training. One of the problems with it is when we tell members of staff, if you get an email that you don't expect, call the person up and check out of band that the email is legitimate, the content's what was expected, those kinds of things. That works if I get an email that I don't expect and I call the person on the established phone number. But with attacks like this, where fraudsters are able to use you know, modified voice samples, maybe they can say, please do this bank transfer. Oh, if you have any problems with this, or if this seems suspicious, or you can't do it immediately, call me on this number and get your staff to call them on, on the number. There's those concerns. And I am yet to see any security awareness training talking about these kinds of things. If your security awareness training is a year out of date, it's not going to help for these things. So just something to consider. Deepfakes are a, a kind of cool thing, but just something to consider. So what, el what else do I have as a problem with security awareness training or, or security in general? Well, one of the things is physical access. I, I mentioned physical access and, and companies saying, oh, can you tailgate into our offices for you? I absolutely can, but physical access doesn't work. This is the breaking into buildings part of my job. It's the part I'd recommend the most because trespass is a civil matter, not a crime. So it's better than computer hacking. One way to think about it. Physical access into companies, one of the reasons that we do it is to gain access to computers so we can do the hacking but inside the firewall. Another reason that we might do it is to gain access to sensitive documents, those kinds of things. We've done a lot of physical access testing for law firms where all they care about is case details, it's case notes, those kinds of things. Not necessarily accessing the computer systems. Break into a building, hang around by a printer, you'll get a lot of confidential information. When I, talk to my, when I talk to companies about physical access though, they're always talking about, oh, can you tailgate staff in? Can you follow staff into the building? 
We can, but it isn't the only risk. Previously, when I've talked about this, I've explained the fact that for a lot of companies, I probably don't need to get past reception to gain access to the target. If I'm trying to gain access to the network, does the receptionist have a computer? When I explain the scenario of why I'm there, whatever it is that I go with this time, is the receptionist going to answer with that very common, would you like a coffee whilst you're wet? Which in hacker means, would you like me to leave you unattended with this unlocked computer for several minutes? It's one of those kinds of things. We might not need to gain access past reception. Physical access isn't only tailgating. And physical access definitely is not dressing up like a ninja and rappelling in from the ceiling, which is what some companies think it is. So a good example of things that we can do in the context of physical access, which I find incredibly effective, is cloning, spoofing, and forcing RFID tags. A lot of companies these days, you know, they don't have locks on the door. They've got RFI swipe access. This is another thing that comes up in fact physical access. Generally, when I'm talking about physical access, people will ask me things like, can you pick locks? Yeah, pretty much anyone in InfoSec has at some point picked a lock. Lock spot is a big thing for InfoSec practitioners. Also, you don't lock your office with those kinds of locks, so it's a useless skill in many instances. A lot of offices protect their inside organizations with RFID tags. Um, if you haven't seen one of these before, this is a Proxmark. It's a product that you can buy that allows you to do uh, these kind of attacks. They're fairly expensive, something like 400 euros, but a very, very interesting toolkit for attacking RFID, allowing you to do things like brute forcing pin numbers, those kinds of things. However, a thing that I've recently taken to is um, how subtly can we do this? How cheaply can we do this? How accessible is this attack? 400 euros is a lot of money to some people. So what I did last night, in fact, on Sunday night, uh, I went on eBay, and I found one of these that I managed to get through security, which in itself is hilarious, for 9.99. Um, I actually, when I'm doing these tests, I, I use the Proxmark in its case. This is it outside its case exposed. I use it in its case with a Raspberry Pi, with a battery attached, with the cables kind of connecting the battery pack to the Raspberry Pi. And then so that it's nice and secure, it's all taped together. I didn't try and bring that one through security. <laughs> so please forgive me, I've brought this 999 uh, model available. What it is, it's an RFID cloning device. So whilst the Proxmark can do things like um, spoofing and brute forcing, I'll talk about that in a second, this device will just clone some RFID cards. I've tested it on low frequency uh, T55 cards for anyone who's interested. Um, and if you do physical access for a living, one of the convenient things to do is bring two ID cards with you, one for work and one for cloning. That's a useful thing to do. The thing you might not have noticed about a lot of RFID cards, the most common cards that I come across, um, it's not uncommon for people to place their ID in their badge backwards. Um, I do it. You're seeing me do it now, in fact. Um, I do it because I dislike my ID photograph. It's the main reason that I do this. It's not some security through obscurity thing. One of the things you'll notice from ID cards, though, on the back of the card, quite a few of them have numbers. That is the number that the card is sending to the door to open the door. So if anything, putting your ID in backwards and showing the number on the back is easier for me to break in to the network. It's a thing to consider. There is more and less secure RFID options. There's more and less secure ways of setting these things up. But if I can get fairly close to you, or more accurately, your ID, I can possibly clone it with a device like this. The really funny thing I like about this, for those who can hear it, when you clone a card, it makes a really happy little chirp. One of the things I've done for a company before, an engineering company, I literally stood by their front door and I said, hi, I work in security. We're doing an audit. I need to check your ID. Boop. Yours is good. On your way. <laughs> and then I get myself my little backup card, and then that lets me into all of those doors. The thing with this type of card, though, these um, T55s, those numbers are, uh, are fairly limited. So if you have really good eyes and you can see these numbers, you'll see they all start with the same prefix. In this example, 077, and then a five-digit uh, following sequence. The way that this is broken down is essentially a facility ID and then a tag ID. So the 077 in this instance is referring to the facility, and then it's my ID number. If I can work out your facility ID, it makes it a lot easier to do brute force attacks and those kinds of things. But if I work out what my ID is, and I say I want to get into doors in the building that I work in that I'm not allowed to, like the CEO's office and things like that, I can take my number and I can cycle it. So just start taking numbers off and trying other cards, those kinds of things. A brute force of these cards doesn't have to be starting at a zero and working all the way up. So we can brute force these things. If you know the facility ID for this example of card, then there's only 65,000 possible options. Depending on how quickly you can brute force that against the door, we hold the thing that I 
we in the office refer to as not a bomb. We hold the not a bomb up against the door. It tries code combinations. And for the offices that we try this in, it's often very easy to tell when the door is open because these things are mag locks, right? The mag lock disengages. You can hear it. So you have a conversation. You have a coffee. You chat with somebody next to a door. The door goes thunk. And it's open, and you're in. So these kinds of attacks are, are completely doable. I worked with a company recently. They have a, an exterior gate. It's like an electronic gate that slides back. And it, that is controlled by uh, RFID card. So in the middle of the night, you go and stand next to the gate for a while. You know when you've got a, a valid card because the gate suddenly opens. So you don't even have to gain access to the building to know that you've got a valid ID card, those kinds of things. If you clone one member of staff's ID card, you can cycle for IDs in the similar range so there's maybe get access to other people. And here we have an example. If you know the facility ID and you're just uh, brute forcing tags, if you could do four a second, which is not unusual for these kinds of attacks, you can get through the full key space in four and a half hours. You don't have to do this attack all at the same time. I could spend 30 minutes outside your office every day for a week and a half. No problem for me at all. Eventually, I'll get a hit, and then I'm in the building. I don't need to tailgate. I can come in whenever I need to. I can let myself in. It, it makes it look uh, way more genuine if I come up with ID that lets me in. Um, and also, you don't need to do a full key space attack. That would be starting at zero and going all the way up to 65535. You don't need to do that. You just need to get a valid card that lets you into the building, right? You have more than one employee. So that's the thing. We can clone cards. We can brute force cards. We can spoof cards. These things um, exist. Um, I did mention this is trespass, right? Not recommended, but it's genuinely, in my experience, an attack that employees just haven't considered. So it's, thing, it's a thing to think about. Fairly easy. 9.99 on eBay. If you want the big one, get a Proxmox, something like that. What about pen testing then? So I've talked about social engineering, physical access. What about pen testing? How, how is that different to, to what people think and what should we be thinking about uh, in the future? Pen testing is not just broad scanning. When, when you get a, a, an attack and you break down how attacks against organizations work, um, believe it or not, uh, real attackers don't work in the same way that pen testers do. For, for one thing, they're not going to turn up and start running Nessus and, and vulnerability scanners like that. We're not going to do. Um, full port scans of um, the entire network. But very often, when I sit down at organizations and say, hey, we're here to do a security assessment. We're going to try and break in. We're going to do the privilege escalation thing. It's going to be super cool, or at least it'll be good for us. Companies will say things like, no, no, we want this assessment to be as realistic as possible. We're not even going to tell you our IP addresses. Oh, my, one of my team last year, um, he went to a company, and they keep their IP addresses in the safe. I'm not lying to you. They have a list of IP addresses, their network diagrams. They're in the safe because they consider them that confidential. OK, just plug a laptop into your network and run Wireshark. You will spot many IP addresses. Uh, that's not how real attackers work. And um, I also, on the, the uh, point of VLANs here, uh, I did an assessment recently for a company. In their environment, they have approximately 20 servers and 15 VLANs. That's nearly one VLAN per server. There's network segmentation, and there's taking it too far. But. Uh, a lot of organizations, they, they think they know how attackers work, so they want you to do port scans. They want you to find everything yourself. You're like, no, no, we need this to be a black box assessment. We need this to be an outsider attack. I don't know why you need it to be an outsider attack, because getting insider information is generally fairly trivial. And I'm not talking about examples of when I've gone into companies and the passwords are written on the walls. That has happened before. Oh, in fact, a couple of weeks ago, I found a, a password on Instagram. Somebody had taken a selfie at work, and in the background, there was a password. Brilliant one. I don't know if you know on Instagram, you can do location-based services. If you're targeting a company, put their address into location-based service. That's a good one to remember. I'm not talking about that kind of thing. But you know, when, when it comes to insider information, look at what happened to AT&T. AT&T had a six-year-long campaign against them where an outside attacker just paid members of staff. Hey, what's your password? I'll give you 1,000 pounds. There's a lot of people who work for a lot of companies who don't care that much about your security, and 1,000 pounds is a lot of money. Over a six-year period, they paid the insiders of AT&T something like a million pounds, a million over a six-year period. Significant attack. It was things like uh, disclosing credentials, but also, interestingly, um, installing hardware in the network, so wireless access points, physical access uh, devices, those kinds of things, uh, installing malware. Um, that attack, if you're curious as to why somebody might target AT&T, was to unlock mobile devices to free them from their, their contract restrictions. But hey, it's a good example. A lot of your employees, you give them money, they'll give me access. So realism, having no insider uh, information is not necessarily realistic. But the, the point that I wanted to make in regards to how you might think pen testers or how you might think criminals work following a security guide or a common book on um, how to pen testing 
it's not necessarily realistic. So this is an example methodology. I haven't sourced it from anywhere. It's just an example of some of the steps that attackers might take during a pen test or during an attempt to compromise an organization. Detecting live hosts, performing vulnerability scans, compromising user accounts, performing privilege escalation, those kinds of things. Like I say, you can skip half of this methodology by paying your staff some money for their password, or phishing attacks exist. Successful phishing attack, I'm going to start at the point of compromised user account. It doesn't always work in the same way. Right, so, uh, so that last thing to, to raise here is um, how is it done then? How do uh, attackers um, compromise networks? Very often it's the flavor of the month vulnerability. It's very often what is the big thing. So think of when Heartbleed came out in 2014, suddenly significant spikes in um, Heartbleed uh, type attacks. Here's other examples where that's occurred. We see anyone who does uh, network monitoring on the internet has picked up on these things. And my last slide here is, um, Following, uh, following any new vulnerability coming out, that's what attackers are looking for. That's the thing. We're not going to do broad scans. We're going to pick up on the flavor of the month. What's new? What access do we have? Which means that your detection might not work in the same way that you think it would. And that's it. Thank you for listening. <laughs>